tonight there's a burden in my heart and my prayer has been that the Lord will help to give voice to that which he has put in my spirit. Um, I'm trusting him that at some point in this service he will rain his presence down so mighty that every one of us will feel the need to go to God with a cry in prayer. I'm trusting him. John chapter 17 from verse 1. Exodus 33. Let me begin there. Exodus 33 from verse 12. Exodus 33 from verse 12. <clears throat> then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. 14. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. 15. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your, that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. My emphasis tonight is in verse 13. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. Praise God. Now if you've been around long enough, you would have heard me say specific things as it relates to our salvation experience. For instance, I have said over and over and again that salvation itself is not the end. What I mean by that is when man sinned in the garden, God's enterprise of sending Jesus to come and die for man so that man would be saved, man would be delivered, was not the end in the heart of God. The enterprise of salvation itself is a means to an end. It's a means to an end. So the question we must ask ourselves continually as we progress on the, on the path of spiritual progress, as we journey as pilgrims in the Christian faith, the question we must ask ourselves continually is then, what is the end game? What was it that was on the mind of God that made it that man, God did not just decide to begin again? Because when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, God could have just decided to wipe them out in the, at that point and then create another man. Why is it that God had to go through the labor of sending his only begotten son to suffer agony, pain, shed his blood so that he could save man? We must be able to answer that question because in the answer to that question lies the very burden of our existence. Because we've not been able to answer that question accurately in the body of Christ is the reason we have a counterfeit Christianity that is masquerading as the real thing. So for instance, there is a movement in the body of Christ trying to emphasize the fact that man is so special to God 
and it was because of love that God just decided to kill his son. God just is, 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 is just sitting in heaven overwhelmed with love. And the consequence of him being overwhelmed is the fact that there is nothing you can do, no sin you can commit that will make you to lose your salvation. The reason things like that are flying in the body of Christ is that we do not recognize what the body of our existence really is. We do not. You see, dear brother, dear sister, the reason God came in flesh to die on the cross is not just to save you from your sin. Salvation from your sin needed to occur for what God had in mind to find expression. Without salvation, what it is that God originally wanted to achieve would be impossible. So the only route to the fulfillment of the will and the agenda of God was salvation. Now the question is why? It's because what happened by Adam's sin was that the life that God had put into man had become corrupted. A virus had now plagued that life. And the consequence of that infiltration of that virus is that there was no longer possibility for man to be intimate with God. When God made man, the reason God decided to make man in his own image and likeness was for compatibility. So that man will be able to do business with God. A goat cannot do business with God. Even though the goat has life in itself, that life does not have compatibility with the life of God. So the goat cannot know God on intimate levels. When God created man and man was just a casing, just like, uh, was just modeled into a, um, an, a flax or an effigy or whatever, God now breathed into man and man became a living soul. The essence of that life was for intimacy. You see, God does not save you from sin. And then his primary objective of saving you from sin is to give you a car. God does not save you from sin. And then his primary objective of saving you from sin is to make you comfortable in this life. The end game of salvation is intimacy with God. Now, the reason I began at Exodus was, if you are a student of the Bible, you will realize that the Bible is a book full of metaphors. There are mysteries in scripture that if you are not a careful student, if you are not a student that is given to detail, you will miss the message that Jesus is trying to communicate. Egypt was a type of the world. Everything that happened with Israel and even Israel's deliverance from Egypt was a redemption story. Everything you see that was happening concerning Egypt, even when the plagues began to happen in Egypt, and the Bible says that there was a place in Egypt called Goshen, that the plagues, that Goshen was not affected by the plagues, was the redemption story being told. It was a metaphor to signify what we were going to experience as New Testament believers. Egypt is a symbol of the world. And every time God is going to do anything with man, because man has been corrupted in the garden, when Adam sinned in the garden, it now necessitates that the first thing that God will do for a man on the path of spiritual progress, if you will ever journey with God, the first experience is deliverance. Salvation. God must deliver you from sin. And if you've been here long enough, you will find out that I have taught you that salvation is in three tenses. You are delivered from the penalty of sin. You are delivered from the power of sin. And then eventually you will be delivered from the presence of sin. Are you here? You are delivered from the penalty of sin in the fact that 
everyone that sinned and fell short of the glory of God, there was a judgment hanging upon your head. It's a penalty of sin. Even though we did not sin after the similitude of Adam's sin, every one of us, as you are coming out of your mother's womb, you are coming out with a death sentence. Judgment is hanging upon you. So God needs to deliver you from that judgment first. You have to experience salvation. You have to experience deliverance before your spiritual journey can even begin. What we find in the Christian faith in modern day is that the average believer runs to the altar or unbeliever runs to the altar, says some words and says he's born again. And then he thinks that that is the end game of his Christian faith. This is why you hear funny questions in the body of Christ. Funny questions. Because you see, dear brother, the average believer's burden is not how to please God. Mm. The average Christian in the body of Christ today, their burden is not, I want my life to be a delight unto God. The way our churches and denominations have been structured, the average believer's question, his burden in his heart is, how much of the world can I enjoy without actually falling into sin? How much of the world can I, can I partake of without, without robbing myself of the consequence? I know the world is bad, though, but how, how much, how, how far can I travel without offending God? In quote. So you hear questions like, if you are teaching young people, you now hear questions like, what if I am fornicating and then I die? Then just before I die, I confess my sins. Where will I go? His burden, his burden is not that he wants to live in a way that God is pleased and honored. His burden is, how can I be touching some intricacies, some, some beauty, some, some, some delicacies of the world and yet still be able to find my place in God? Because he thinks that the end game is salvation. So he wants to escape into it. And this is why I know that when we will get to heaven, many people are going to be shocked. They will find out that their enterprise on the face of the earth, there is no record of it in heaven. In heaven, heaven only, only has record of men who actually lived. Hmm. There are people who claim to be living and the only record in heaven is that they existed. That is, there was a day they were born. So they actually came into the realm of men, but they never lived. They never lived. So they walked around in good clothes, they ate good food, they drank coke, they ate meat pie, they went to shop right. But heaven has no record of them living. They never lived. And the reason that exists is because they didn't understand the body. When God saves you, the year is just beginning. I didn't come with a message. I came with a charge. When God saves you, I'm actually going to start teaching on consecration from next week Sunday. When we begin the fast. And there are things I will say. If you are not prepared for the year, you will not like me. Mm, um, I, 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 God gave me a rod. It's a rod. A rod. I'm coming with a rod. And I want to means words. Except the Lord, the Lord now comes and put a finger on my spirit. Because the way I'm feeling this year, I'm feeling responsible for a generation. And when I begin to feel like this, I know that see, all hell has broken loose. Satan has released his best. And warriors must man the gate. Men who understand what their horn is in the spirit must now come into their ordinations in God and wield the scepter. This is the way we are going to push back the hand of Satan. Functionaries who have come of age. You know, I've been telling you, you see, what I have seen in the spirit is that this year, many men will come of age. You know, the Bible says that when Moses came of age, it entered into his heart that he should go and see his brethren. Many, many are going to come of age. And the consequence of your coming of age is that God will clothe you. Your horn will now be exalted. 
oil will now come upon the very thing that makes you unique. Your shape in the spirit will now become visible to all men. This is that year. This is that year. 